I, I know some of you in here, I recognize quite a few folks, and uh, thanks for the DCC students for showing up. They're all back there. So, <laughs> howdy. So, um, I'm an artist, and uh, usually when I tell that, a lot of folks just immediately assume that I'm an artist in, well, you know, the traditional sense of like, well, so what do you paint? Or what, what media do you work in? And I find that really frustrating, because uh, the thing is, I don't really think of my uh, practice having any type of medium or material, but if anything, I think I work with information, and I work with uh, strategies of working and different ways of problem solving, and really looking at creative problem solving. So uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing, I'm going to show you a lot of the work that, I'm, uh, that I've been working on over the years, or actually, I'm showing sure you know, one project. I'm going to show you my free bird, as I call it, you know, my big hit song. But before that, uh, I want to go a little bit about some of the uh, more, uh, some of the things that have come around that I've been really interested in. A friend of mine, uh, Golan Levin at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, recently posted this image on his uh, blog, and I was really fascinated by this. And this is uh, Michael Neymark, who was uh, at MIT in the late 70s, early 80s. And what you're basically looking at here is Michael uh, strapping on this camera on the top of his Jeep and driving around Aspen, doing the Aspen movie map. And of course, back in 1978, a lot of folks were like, well, why would you do this? And this is as an, as an artist, he's going around filming every street in this small town, and then you go in and you actually play back each of the frames. Looks familiar, doesn't it? 2007? Again, uh, I don't think we were ready for this. We were not ready for this type of a system back then, and yet, culturally, it took us almost 30 years to catch up to this. And actually, when you look at these two side by side, it's quite striking. When you see the, the, the Google camera with this, uh, the Google car with the camera and the street view, and Michael's Jeep and Aspen movie map from uh, 1978. So, you know, I'm a big fan of art that barely passes for art. And uh, I think Mel Chin is a really good example here. And Mel, uh, in, in, early, in 1990, he went to uh, this uh, dump outside of Minneapolis where uh, it was, it's, it's a toxic waste dump. I mean, it's just absolutely nasty with every kind of toxic chemical in there. And he was researching this idea of uh, these plants, these hyperaccumulators that, that are attracted to these heavy metals. So he went to, to some scientists and said, hey, I got this idea, and if I plant these, maybe it'll pull this, maybe it'll clean up the soil. And of course the scientists are like, this will never work. This is, this is great that you think this is gonna do something, but it, realistically, this is not going to work. So of course, being the wacky artist, he's like, okay, well, you know what? Whether it works or not, I'm gonna try it anyway. Went out there, planted a whole bunch of these uh, so, well, they're a type of sunflower. And sure enough, after the sunflowers were harvested, there were chunks of metal inside the stalks. And this technique is now used uh, for landfill cleanup in, in many parts of the world. Also, another project with Mel, um, and again, I mean, we're not really sure, you know, it's, is, is Revival Field, is, is this a sculpture? Is this a community project? Is this activism? Is this environmental cleanup? He's an artist, but you know, he's not a scientist, but at the same time, it's, it has social impact, and it, again, barely passes for art. So another project that I'm really fascinated about that Mel was doing is uh, Fundred. So after Katrina, he was asked to come out to New Orleans to help rebuild the, the city. And he went there and said, this is beyond my scope. This, the devastation is too great. I'm sorry, but I really can't do anything. And he, and he walked away from it, and he started thinking, well, what what can, what can be done? And then he came to the realization that the problem in New Orleans was not the, the storm. Of course, the storm was devastating, but the problem was already there before the storm, and that was the lead poisoning that was in the soil. So there are certain parts, for example, I think Norway, uh, it's something like 17 parts per million that's legal of, of lead in the soil. Canada is something like 40. The US is a couple of hundred. Uh, again, the numbers I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm just giving you the range of them. Uh, and there are certain parts in New Orleans where it's in the thousands. And of course, the lead poisoning causes erratic behavior, it causes brain damage, it causes violence. And the, you know, to no one's surprise, some parts of New Orleans are some of the scariest neighborhoods in, in, in the country with some of the highest death rates. So uh, he, he said, okay, in order to rebuild New Orleans, we need to replace all the soil. And it's not exactly a small city, and it's a substantial <laughs> amount of effort. So he's talking to some scientists and some politicians and some people, and they're like, well, you know, this, you can't do this. This is just an insane project, uh, covering, replacing all the soil of a, of a major American city. That's no small task. And of course, it'll, and, and it'll cost so much, you could never do this. So I said, okay, how much is it going to cost? 
And it's like, a lot of money. It's like, no, no, give me a number. Give me an exact, no give me a rough number of what I need to get to do this project. And eventually, one of the scientists sold him uh, $300 million. So of course, Mel, being the artist, says, OK, I'll bring you $300 million. So he went into uh, school groups throughout the country and had uh, school children. They're primarily school children. There are some adults involved as well. And each person draw, drew one $100 bill, as you can see over here. And there's all these schools. And he's an, he has an armored truck that was used in Darlington at the Speedway. And this armored truck travels throughout the country, picking up these drawn $100 bills. And as they bring them in, so basically what he's doing is he's organizing 3 million kids that are drawing $100 bills, which will be $300 million. And at the end of this, he's gotten pretty close to it. And at the end of this project, the plan is to bring it to the steps of the Capitol and ask Congress for an even exchange. So again, is this art? Is this activism? Is this social gathering? I don't know, and I, and I don't think it really matters. I, th I don't think it really matters. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and tell you a little bit about uh, the project that I've been working on for the last eight years or so. And uh, this is a project called Tracking Transients, and uh, it started out after I was reported as a, or erroneously reported as a terrorist suspect. So there was a report that the uh, FBI got that an Arab man fled on September 12th who was hoarding explosives. Never mind, I'm not Arab. Never mind, it wasn't the 12th. But you know, if you see something, say something, even if it's wrong. So uh, I spent six months of my life with the FBI, justifying every moment of my existence. Uh, basically, and I'm telling these guys, guys, you know, I'm, I'm innocent. And of course, after six months and nine consecutive polygraphs, they said, yeah, we, 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 know, we believe you. I said, well, great. Well, you know, can I get a letter saying I'm OK? Problem is, in order to be formally cleared, you have to be formally charged. So, uh, you know, I travel a lot, and all we need is the last guy at the last airport not to get the last memo. Here we go all over again. So I said, guys, uh, you know, what do we do? What do we do if, if I do get in trouble? He said, well, here's some phone numbers. If you get into trouble, give us a call. We'll take care of it. So ever since then, I'd call my FBI agent. I'd, I'd say, hey, I got to go. He'd say, okay, where are you going? I'm going to Paris. Okay, what's your flight numbers? And it's not that I had to do this, but I chose to do this. It was a voluntary action on my part. And uh, so I started sharing information with them. Then it slowly, you know, then these phone calls got longer, and then we got emails. The, the emails got longer, then emails with lots of pictures and writing to my FBI agent saying that, hey, you know, I'm in Cambodia this month. The, the beaches are wonderful. The, the food is good. You, know, you should consider a vacation here. I would basically like, tell them every little detail of my life, you know, because during the investigation, when you're face to face with someone that essentially decides life or death, uh, you don't behave like a rational human being. And, and in that process, I told them every little detail. I mean, you do whatever you have to do to first survive. Uh, and in my case, survival really meant cooperate. And I cooperated every little bit. So let me show you a little bit about what this project is uh, in real time. So I basically, back in 2003, I wrote some clunky code for my phone that tracks me. So this is way before Google Latitude, way before Foursquare, way before Facebook. Uh, and uh, you can see this little flashing arrow, and that, that's me, that one pixel. I mean, you can kind of see, you know, there's a stadium there, there's a parking lot, you can see a college campus, you can kind of recognize that image, too. So these are some of the, uh, some of the highway signs. This is Brooklyn, Iowa, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, so you get an idea that there's a river down there, there's a bay. We can come out a little further, and you can see that in the northeast. Uh, basically, this tracks me 24-7 at any given moment. The irony is that you know, when I first started this project, I actually went to a lot of these telecom companies and I went to a lot of transportation research places saying, you know, guys, I want to develop something that'll tell everyone everything about where I am, what I'm doing. I want to share every bit of my personal information. And they all looked at me like, you're crazy. Why in the world would you ever want to do this? Well, the irony is that you know, not even eight years later, there's 800 million people on Facebook alone doing this. So in a way, you know, what started out as an incredibly pragmatic solution of not being shipped off to Gitmo uh, then sort of evolved into art. And then I don't think it's even art anymore because there's just so many people doing this. So in a way, I've become completely obsolete in what I'm doing in, in, with this project. So yeah, you can see that. Well, the FBI needs to know. You know I'm all about full disclosure here. So anyway, so I want to I want to wrap it up by asking you a question. So because I think one of the things is that we tend to look at art in a very traditional manner. We tend to think of art in in a manner that uh, 
that, that's, it's a very traditional definition. I think we should really look at it more as creativity and innovation and problem solving. And I really think one of the, one of the things is that, you know, how can we integrate the arts to foster more innovation and creativity? And, and this, is, uh, this is something, because, you know, when we talk about, say, budget crisis, the first thing that gets cut at public schools is the arts. But this is really what's crucial to creating some of the most innovative solutions that are out there. If we're trying to solve the same problem over and over and over, I don't think that really works using the traditional ways because we'll get the same results. So uh, how do we work this? And maybe this is something that this is, I mean, I think this should be something also open to everyone here, but I think I'd really be curious to get the take of uh, you three folks on this. So, Why don't you join you. him up on stage and we can answer that question maybe. I think the interesting thing about your question is that, and your first example, or Mel, one of Mel's uh, solutions, was that he looked at it from a completely different way. Actually, in both yeah. of his, he looked at it, in both of his, he, <laughs> he looked at the problems upside down and uh, took on the impossible. Um, I was wondering, though, to what degree, when he chose the dirt as a problem, as opposed to everything else he could have chosen, yeah. did he choose it for art? Because he had the idea of how he could solve it, or did he choose it because he really, really, really thought that was the biggest problem? I think, well, I'm, I, I, I mean, I, I know Mel relatively well, but we never actually talked specifically about why that particular project. But I think as artists, you know, we're, we're, we do projects all over, and it's kind of like, okay, we, there's a public art project in this city, so what do you want to do? And usually, public art would mean, well, you know, we're going to get a monument, or we're going to get a fountain. And instead of a fountain, he decides to do this crazy project out in the middle of nowhere that very few people actually see, but it has some, so much of an impact on the community. So I think, again, uh, to, 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 to turn it upside down, to instead of looking at it in a direct line, but to kind of circumvent it and go around it, and, and it becomes a really squiggly road rather than the direct way. I think that's the value in integrating the art mm -hmm. into everything else. Yeah. But how do, you, how do you folks do it? I mean, at your, at your companies, I mean, what, how well, does this take place? I think you stepped on something even more important. Like, we, we don't foster creativity in any of our schools. So it's not about art or science or anything. It's about creativity and thinking about problems in new and interesting ways. Um, Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson always talks about, we've killed creativity. They do all these, like, like tests with kids. Though. So they'll give like some kindergartners like a, uh, a paper clip and say, what can you do with this? And they'll come up with like 30 or 40 different things. And then they'll give like a second grader the paper clip and they can do 20 things with it. And by the time they've gotten to high school, there's one thing that a paper clip can do. Um, so that's very sad. And so I think really what you're stepping back and the real thing we all need to think about is how do we foster creativity? How do we think about problems in new ways? Um, I think our next speaker is going to be talking about this because that's what entrepreneurship is about, looking at the problems in a new way and trying to make sure that, you know, we have a society that accepts that. I guess I would say that one of the key characteristics of creativity is not having the idea. In fact, I think, Abdur, you were saying earlier, ideas are cheap. Being creative is not the problem. Doing something is the problem. So from my perspective, it's not taking, it just that generating the idea because I can write programs that can generate cheap ideas. It's actually acting on it. And so one aspect from, from my perspective would be um, there's sort of an engineering side to the, to the art that you do. You had to write some code. You actually had to do something. It was kind of probably difficult at the time, right? One of the cool things about all art is that there's a certain element of technology involved, right? And so one of the interesting aspects, I think, for me is how does an artist get control of the technology so it gets out of the way? So that you can do what you really want to do. And so, for example, a cellist has a piece of technology that's really, really flaky. If you think about it, that there's this big construction of wood that's under high tension and these weirdo strings that, uh, that op op operate very non-linear fashion, and yet she manages to make fantastic music with it, right? And so a big question here is, ideas are cheap. How do you get the engineering and technology out of the way so you can do what your heart really wants to do? 
Another, just last thought on this, another way that I integrate um, creativity and art into the technology we build in my group is we value it, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's the first step. If technologists don't value it, then you're gonna have a hard time. I think Mel impressed me by his fortitude and his, you know, stick to which yeah. was fantastic. So the FBI likes you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, they, they, I think they, they come feel by safe and they visit. Well, they, I mean, I feel really safe knowing that they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think, you know, it, it goes back to this thing. I think we have a tendency to accessorize with the arts. That we, well, you know, it's kind of, it's not really, come and decorate at the end. And instead, how do you, how do you bring them in from day one, from the ground up, rather than as, as something at the end? 